Everybody seen this? This has been all over the news. This is what we call the Atacama humanoid. Um, first of all, I don't know what it is. Every scientist has looked at it and says, oh my God, it looks like an alien. Well, perhaps, we don't know. It's a mystery, it's an enigma wrapped in a mystery. It may be something prosaic, but I don't believe so. It's actually interesting. I have not had a person who I've shown the things to who hasn't been absolutely fascinated. Oh, I know. Right, and, but it's only when you want to talk about it slightly openly that suddenly everybody shuts down. Right. Hey, Tom. Right. If it is something interesting, right, let's say in the most interesting of all uh, ways from a clinical standpoint, it's a human mutation, right? One of the things that could, has to be answered because just a preliminary examination of this sample is that it is obviously older than just an aborted fetus, right? So a preliminary examination tells you that this is uh, a small human, perhaps, right, that has lived post-birth for a sufficiently long period of time that how do you explain how something six inches tall survived to any length of time uh, that would uh, allow for it to survive a hundred or a thousand years ago. In the most interesting and outrageous case, uh, it is something that is not human and not uh, primate, but still hominid. How do we explain a hominid that small? So the answer is, before we get too excited uh, and spend too much time speculating, is let's just use the techniques that we use in the laboratory every single day to answer the question. So luckily, uh, here at Stanford, we happen to have literally the world's expert, the man who wrote the book on bone dysplasias and syndromes, a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Ralph Lachman. We went to Barcelona where this little being is stored. We took exact x-rays that he requested from Stanford and brought them back, hand carried them back, as well as on a computerized disc, which is now on our website, you can see it. He looked at it and he said, well, first of all, there is no form of dwarfism or genetic defect that explains everything seen in this being. So one of the first things that Dr. Lachman uh, immediately remarked upon was the shape of the head and the skull. Uh, that uh, it was not something that he uh, is accustomed to seeing. Certain aspects of the skull and certain aspects of the potential mutations and syndromes that might account for the specimen uh, were, uh, were present. But what was remarkable, at least in my discussions uh, with him, that any, any given syndrome often has uh, co-phenotypes or co-events that would occur. And it was quite interesting uh, and in some ways exciting as he would uh, remark upon a particular uh, feature of the specimen and then find that the associated features that you would expect from a syndrome of that nature were not found. What you'll also see is that he says it has 10 ribs. Occasionally there are uh, human mutations where there's perhaps 11 uh, ribs, but only rarely is it ever seen that there is 10, and then never are those kinds of mutations seen associated with the other features of the, of the skull and or face. So again, if this is human, uh, and it, it has a constellation of mutations that have not been seen before, uh, doesn't discount that it might be such a constellation of mutations, but it's just that they've never been seen before. What he didn't notice, but I will point it out to you, it has four skull bones. Rather, rather than the six major ones we have. It's symmetrical, and the symmetry is what's also very important. The only asymmetry I want to point out, uh, which, which is mentioned in Dr. Lockman's report, is the fact that it had a, a terrible blow to what we would call our right mastoid air cell area of the skull that crushed the skull and kind of torqued the whole skull and also a, a, a fracture of the right uh, humerus. The epiphyseal plates, if you look at the x-ray, which is the growth plates. You know when you have you know, the growth plates in a kid and they, they hurt their leg? The growth plates and the bone density is that of a six to eight year old. 
the idea here is that uh, in the growing knee or in the growing joint, uh, mostly it is made of cartilage, uh, and that you get a mineralization of the cartilage uh, and a continued growth of this uh, so-called growth plate. There are standards, right? There are expectations that uh, you will have the uh, growth plate uh, be of a certain size for a certain age. The, the shock, I think, uh, and the surprise was, and the, and the absolute certainty that uh, Dr. Lockman had was that this specimen was clearly not fetal, right? Uh, even though the size of the specimen would, would suggest that it's, fe it's fetal, but that by comparing the growth plates uh, to known standards, this is clearly between six to eight years old. All right, now call me crazy, but I'm just a doctor. But I can tell you, I've taken care of a lot of children that are six and eight year olds. I've never seen one six inches tall. This is six inches, 13 centimeters. What six to eight year old can live to be only six inches tall? Number one. Number two, how did it live? It was found in the driest place on earth, the Atacama Desert in Chile, northern Chile. It is estimated to be in, in many decades and probably hundreds of years old. There was no neonatal intensive care unit in Chile at that time. There may not be now. And even at the best neonatal intensive care unit in the world today, you could not keep this person, for lack of a better word, alive. So the question becomes, what is it? It's quite clear that this is uh, a real sample, this is a real specimen, this is not something somebody glued together. Anybody who thinks that this is something that is glued together, I challenge them to do it, right? And I challenge them to be able to subject such a thing to an x-ray and or CRT image and then let that pass the world's expert in bone dysplasia, right? So that has not been done. Since it doesn't conform to any known uh, form of dwarfism, it could very possibly be a type of progeria, which is when you have a, a very advanced aging process. But he seriously doubted it. Now, fast forward to some of the early work. Now, this has been misinterpreted in the internet, unfortunately, not only uh, on the Huffington Post, um, but also in, in a number of other minor uh, news outlets about the genetic report. I want to be very careful. Number one, keep this number in mind, a Neanderthal is 99.5% genetically identical to everyone in this room. Okay, the chimpanzee and the great apes, 96 to 97 or more percent identical genetically. This being has a big match to human genome, but it's an upright creature with a very large cranial vault, three times the size of our cranial vault from the eyes up. So we would expect a lot of the operative genes, it was, if it was in this 3D dimension, and it's a humanoid, to have some match. What's unusual, although nothing can be concluded yet from it, is that 9% of the genetic material is, quote, unmatching. Now this is on a computerized run at the best lab in the world, out of Stanford, and, the, and it was checked three times. 9%. Now, is that all computer read error? Maybe. Is it all what's called DNA junk? Perhaps. We don't know. It's going to take years to go through what the computer kicked out into the trash can of unmatched DNA to figure out what is in there. Dr. Nolan, the Stanford head of the team, doesn't know. I don't know. What we know is this. It's going to take years and at least, if we're lucky, a year or two, to go through that, because it's two million base pairs of genetic material unmatched. Now, if you were dealing with uh, my DNA or yours, and you had a lot of un unmatching, you just leave it alone, because we know we're just humans. And it's just like, well, it was a computer error, or it was this or that. But when you have something that looks like that, What you have is something that cannot just be tossed away because so far, and this is something I want you to listen to extremely carefully, the genes that control for progeria, advanced aging, or dwarfism are showing no mutations. This is a six inch 
six to eight year old. Get it? Those, why isn't there something in there? So this is still a mystery. Now, once the geneticists say human, use the word human, the media that aren't well versed in genetic research said, oh, well, case closed. Case is just starting. It has just begun. And I can tell you that it may be years before we get an answer on this. We have to do probably a year or two or three of research and I'll remind people that the Human Genome Project cost billions of dollars and took 10 years and thousands of scientists. We're just going into something that's basically an unknown. And the other thing that's come to light is that there may be more of these. We're on the lead to one that may exist and have been found in Puerto Rico. There are reports that there are more of these that are in uh, Chile and we have videotapes and photographs of a creature that looks very similar to this one that was a little more mature, maybe less than a foot tall, that was uh, found in Russia, uh, was kept alive for a number of, of months apparently. I found out about it in 1996, but too late, the FSB, which w took the place of the KGB, had apparently confiscated it by then. So we have to be very careful. I'm not saying it's ET. I'm saying we don't know. but. Looking at the big clinical picture, it just cannot just be a normal, defected human if it lived to be six to eight years of age and is only six inches tall. The point is, there's a great deal of mysterious information around this, and we have to be very careful to proclaim it one thing or another. People are proclaiming it ET. I'm saying we don't know quite what it is. Other people are saying, ah, we solved the mystery because it has so much human DNA in it. No, we're not saying that either because there's still this 9% unmatched, which could be everything from computer read error to junk DNA to where the mystery of how this thing existed. Well, I mean, no matter what, I mean, if you're a scientist and in the biology, yeah. if this is, we know this is an organism, it's not right. matched up to any primate, right. any ancient hominid, any modern primate, any thing that is known. So it's, it's an unknown. So right. that's what discovery is about. And, and so, you know, the point I make to people is that so let it go where it goes. Mm -hmm. and right. Follow the science yeah. where it takes you. And so there's a great deal of research that has to be done. Uh, I, an expedition to do this properly would cost probably 10 times what it, it costs to do this documentary. And we, if somebody wants to underwrite that, I'll be there with bills on it. The follow on to this after you do the genetic analysis is an expedition to the Atacama Desert to mm -hmm. further right. do um, investigations into this region and uh, because of reports that there are more than one of these. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if a second one were to be found, that would be... Right. Well, positive. if there's a second one, uh, then I think <laughs> all bets are off. Mm -hmm.